NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. Howdy ho, summer listeners. I imagine that wherever you are right now, the summer heat and humidity is upon you or are upon you. I said to a friend the other day, I'm so glad July decided to be June this year because it was so cool. But then wham, I spoke way too soon. We have heat in Connecticut and Long Island. It's definitely the thick of summer. So we want to bring forward even more heat by having the one and only Gordon Corman to our show to help celebrate, ready for this, his 100th publication. The fort was just released, finger snaps all around. We are beyond proud to have him as well as teacher leader, Allison Fallon, a middle school EL, ELA teacher from Central Middle School in Greenwich, Connecticut. Tanya, how are you? I haven't seen you. How have you been the last few weeks? Are you staying cool? Well, it's super weird to not talk to you every other week, Brian. So I felt a lull in the summer. Also, as you know, I live in near San Francisco, which Mark Twain once described as the coldest winter he ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. So it's pretty easy to stay cool over here in July. The fog rolls in, I wear sweaters. So staying cool enough. However, as you said, we're bringing the heat with this show. I'm so excited. When you called me and told me that Gordon Corman had agreed to be on our show to celebrate his hundredth book, I nearly did cartwheels. Um, We know that teachers are looking for incredible beach reads while they still have time to dip their toes in the sand and find lounge chairs by the local pools. And we want them to know that Gordon Corman has his hundredth book out, that every Gordon Corman book is classroom ready, and his story of becoming a writer is one of a kind. We can't wait to kick off this show. Well, I knew we had the perfect teacher author match earlier this spring when Allison Fallon brought eighth grade students to Fairfield University for a celebration of hope in high school preparation. It was there that I met and Allison met Gordon Corman ourselves. And I said, yep, showtime. I wonder if he's available. And he was. Gordon Corman introduced himself himself as a regular guy who just happened to write 100 books for kids and adolescent readers. Born in Montreal in October of 1963, his writing career began in the seventh grade when he took English with his track coach. Then he was challenged to write every day for more than four months, and he finished his first novel, This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall. With his mother as his typist, he sent it to Scholastic and voila, published as a freshman in high school. That was just the beginning. He has sold over, ready? 30 million copies of his books, many translated in over 30 languages. I can't even comprehend that. Currently, Gordon lives in Long Island, outside of New York City, where he continues to love visiting schools, teachers, and driving his own children to wherever they need to be. His new book, The Fort, about a group of kids who stumble on an abandoned Cold War era bomb shelter, was released this summer and needs to be checked out by you as soon as possible. We're so excited. And also that Brian, you have introduced us to yet another perfect teacher, writer, interviewer. I'm excited to be able to introduce everybody to Allison Fallon. She's an eighth grade teacher and department head at Central Middle School in Greenwich, Connecticut. She's been teaching for 14 years as a fellow National Writing Project member, a CWP graduate and teacher. In 2021, Allison was awarded the Distinguished Distinguished Teacher Award for Greenwich Public Schools. When she's not teaching or crafting curriculum, she's busy with her two daughters, husband, and guinea pigs, exploring the outdoors, eating ice cream, and seeking new reading and writing adventures. Allison, welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm going to invite you to introduce to our listeners an opportunity, something they might want to write about to prime the pump for to get ready to listen to this interview with Gordon Corman. And then we'll, at the end, we'll invite them to a writing prompt to sort of write out of this interview as well. Um, We won't stop and write together, but listeners who are listening to a recorded version of the show could pause and write if they chose to. So Allison, what did you bring for us today? Sure. So I was taking some inspiration from Gordon, your new book, The Fort, and also from everything that's just been happening around us lately. And I was like, let's do something positive for a change. So where is your happy place? Sometimes we seek refuge from the world around us. What place or space feels most like home and why? 
Well, we wish you the best uh, luck. Um, I'm going to, I don't know if you noticed when I was introducing everyone, but my dog Carol was wrestling with my feet and I was trying to get her off of me and not bark. But we say have a great conversation and we'll see you in a few minutes. Yeah, enjoy. Thank you. Well, I have to say I am I am honored to be able to interview you, Gordon. Um, it was a pleasure to get to meet you briefly when um, my middle school's eighth grade came over to central um, came over to Fairfield University in this past June, and for you to make the trip up, I'm thank you. That was it was lovely, and the kids were just raving about the experience. And um, I'm super pumped to ask you these questions and get sure. to know a little bit more. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. What a great group of kids. Yeah, they are. They are. And especially everything that group has been through. They really didn't have a middle school experience with COVID. The last time they had real school was fifth grade. So it, it was nice to finally take them on a field trip. It was like their first field trip since fifth grade. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm so happy you could be a part of it. Um, so we have a few questions that um, I would love to hear your, and I'm sure our viewers would love to hear your responses to them. And I have to say, I was I was peeking around a little bit at your website. So the first the first question might sound a little bit familiar because I, I borrowed some of your own words here. And I am curious about the following. So there's something special about creating a group of characters and taking them out for a spin like a well-tuned Lamborghini. Those are your words, Mr. Corman. Can you share with us some of your favorite characters from your writing, as well as some of your favorite from other literature? Wow. Um, so, you know, in my own books, there's always, I, I have a, a, a bad recency bias, you know? So, uh, I mean, the, I, I, the crew with the fort is just very much in, in my head right now. Um, because that book just came out and um, you're always sort of, you know, I don't really have a favorite, but I always sort of get the most pumped up about what's, um, what's newest. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, it's, it's not necessarily the big movers of the story that are the most fun to write. Like when I was, um, when I was writing the fort, the character of Mitchell, just, um, just, you know, uh, he's a great kid, but he's got some problems and he's, he suffers from OCD and he sees the world, I think, in just a really, I, I mean, it's, it's poignant yet it's it's really kind of fun like it was great to tell the story from from his perspective I, I tell a lot of books where um, I, I narrate each chapter from a different character's point of view and it's just a really fun way to get into to kids heads but uh, my time inside uh, Mitchell's head was was I think my favorite writing this particular book um, but but I've got a few you know um, Jet Baranoff from Unplugged is the son of uh, a tech billionaire. Like in, in a way, he's he's sort of tech royalty. His father is the the founder of Fuego, the largest tech platform in in the world. Fuego is bigger than Apple, Google, and Facebook combined. Um, you know, I wrote an older book called Schooled, uh, and the main character is this kid Capricorn Anderson who is um, raised by his grandmother on the remnants of the hippie commune that she formed in 1967. So this kid, uh, a, a today eighth grader, with, with which I'm sure you are familiar, uh, is, is basically a 13 year old hippie. You, you know, he wears uh, ponchos and love beads and peace signs and tie dye. And, you, you know, he's never watched TV and he's, you know, I never had a haircut, um, but also, you know, he gets to school as an eighth grader. They show him his locker because he's been homeschooled on this commune and he kind of can't figure out what it's for because he's never really owned anything, right? Like on a commune, ev everybody shares. Um, so it, it was just a fascinating character to write about just because almost like even the, the most mundane things that you show him from the real world, you, you know, he, he sees almost as an alien kind of seeing them for the, the first time. But um, I don't know, it, you know, it's really hard to, um, to uh, pick out characters from, from literature that, that are my favorites. I mean, I'm a, 
a huge fan of of what you would call old school middle grade, right? Like um, I was in fourth grade, the year Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing was published. I don't know if it was my favorite book, but it was the first book where, you know, I could be one of these kids. I could be a fourth grade nothing. Um, you, you know, the great brain was was a, a favorite of mine. Uh, the kids in the Mad Scientist Club. That's sort of maybe where I kind of discovered the ensemble cast of kind of protagonists in 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 Kidlet. And um, I, I got to go back to you know when when, you, when you're talking about adult books, this may seem a little out there, but um, if you're familiar with the um, the Pulitzer Prize winning A Confederacy of Dunces. Um, the character Ignatius Riley, uh, mm -hmm. the protagonist of that one is, I think one of the most unique, uh, well-drawn, tragic yet hilarious characters uh, I've ever experienced in literature. That's awesome. It's, it's, it's interesting. And you, you've mentioned Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. I was in fourth grade when, um, not the book, but the TV series, Hey Arnold came out. And, and he, grew, he grows up in the, in the city and I'm from Brooklyn. And, and the idea of being on the stoop and having the apartment. And I remember just being like, I feel so connected to this. So it's funny when kids now, they, they come in and they're, it's like, retro to wear Nickelodeon stuff. And I'm like, oh, it's Hey Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about with like Mitchells and even in school, do, do you have to do a little bit of research to kind of craft these characters? Um, oh, for sure. And especially with, with, um, with something like OCD where you just want to get it right. And, and we had, um, we had readers kind of read it over just to make sure that, you know, you don't want to portray something like that incorrectly because uh, many readers are, are dealing with that to, to various extents in their lives. Um, I guess in a way, like the, the fun part of the fort was the, the whole retro of it. You know, that, that, um, that you know, that this bomb shelter that they discover, it's kind of an old fallout shelter from the Cold War is also uh, inadvertently a time capsule to kind of like the 70s and early 80s and that was sort of that was sort of my time when i was you know probably a middle grade to young adult to 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 college kid you, you know and uh and so in a way it was kind of like uh a tribute to the stuff that was the coolest when i thought stuff was when I was the most inclined to find stuff really, really cool. And, um, and having a, a bunch of today's kids sort of experience it uh, as, as kind of, in, in a kind of a retro way was, uh, was sort of a, a little personal pleasure that I took out of writing the fort. I, I have to say, I, I not even a few pages in was like, I'm gonna love this book because I, although I'm an English teacher, I do enjoy history quite a bit. And my favorite time period is that Cold War era. So to go back in time and kind of see this, I was like, I am, I am hooked here because this is something that if I stumbled upon as a 12, 13 year old, I would be fascinated. So that actually leads me to, um, I have a specific question for the fort. I'm very excited to see that you're tying together aspects from the past and the present. So it's taking place in this ab ab abandoned bomb shelter and you have like this hurricane ripping through their town. Was it intentional to include these social issues in your text? How do these topics and eventual themes get communicated to readers and what led you to choose choose such topics for this particular book and these particular characters? Well, I mean, for the, for the hurricane, I have to say it's just sort of a plot device, right? I mean, here's this, this, uh, this underground, you know, thing, structure that has been, that has been kind of undiscovered for all these years. And so the hurricane to me was sort of a plausible reason why what's been lost for all this time is suddenly the hatch is kind of uncovered by, by the storm. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I don't know necessarily if I had uh, a specific agenda for, for using the Cold War as a time, except that, you know, conveniently it was the time, you, you know, that's when you built your bomb shelter, right? The, and I do remember uh, being that age in, in the news, you know, you'd hear occasionally about 
you know, people who would sort of be survivalists of some type or another, and they would go there and they've got, you know, canned food for three years stocked in this sort of underground, underground thing. Um, I think more, more significantly for, for the message that I was trying to uh, sort of communicate in the fort was the fact that the, the town is just um, kind of like a factory town where the yeah. factory has not shut down and um, and a lot of people have been laid off. And, you know, Mitchell's mom, for example, used to work at the factory. And to replace that, she's working three jobs around the clock, no health insurance, you, you know. So I, I sort of wanted to, to speak to that particular reality that many kids have to, um, have to deal with today you know yeah, um absolutely. and uh the other idea is i mean i think there's something very universal about having a fort right having a a clubhouse or a hiding place like a place that is a hundred percent totally uh totally yours but i also wanted to uh involve a kind of a cast of characters uh for whom that fort is especially meaningful. You, you know, it, it is there. There could never be uh, a group of kids who who needs a place like that more. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's really interesting to kind of see how all of that kind of meshes together in a story to to make sense. And it's it's really interesting. And I guess like looking at your hundredth book and then looking back at, at the books that I've read that um, you have written and titles, it seems that you write quite a bit about war stories and war stories, particularly for, for young adults. So some people may feel that war and kids don't go together and that it might not be the best topic for young minds to explore, but what led you to write these stories and what is the value of writing such stories focused on such young adult audiences? Why tell these war stories to young adults? Well, I mean, it, it's it's us, you know, and there there always is, there always is kind of the balance between you, you know you're writing for kids, and um, and you're you know so you don't necessarily want to be gross or you know or or super you, you know dark or or you know write about nothing but death and carnage and, and all that, but at the same time. Um, I think that there there is something really really key. I I suspect that this probably applies to any any audience. But when you're writing sort of a middle grade young adult novel, um, honesty is one of the most important things that you, that you, you know. And that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be realistic, right? I mean, I think that uh, I I'm a Harry Potter fan. Right. And, you know, I'm not a wizard. <laughs> as far as I know, there aren't any wizards, but um, yet those books are written uh, with great humor and great honesty. You know, and I think that's one of the things that makes them hugely attractive. So it, regardless of whether I'm writing realistic fiction or something with a kind of a paranormal component to it, I, I feel like you have to be really, really honest with with your readers. And, you know, the Cold War, the Second World War, you, you know, I mean, going back, the sinking of the Titanic is, you, you know, or um, I, I've written, uh, for example, a, a trilogy about kids who are climbers, who are, are trying to become the youngest climber uh, in history to conquer Mount Everest, you, you know, and, um, and at that time, when I wrote it, for every uh, for every four climbers who had summited mm -hmm. uh, Everest, one climber had died somewhere on the mountain uh, trying, right? Uh, so I didn't think that if, if I'm writing about a team of four kids in my expedition to, to reach the summit of Everest, it was, you know, you're, you're not really doing justice to the difficulty and the danger of of your topic unless you're willing to be honest about the fact that they they might not one of them might not be coming home again and um and i think that uh you, you know the dangers the dangerous things in our lives like the cold war or you, you know military conflicts or you know in the case of in the case of um 
the Ford, a, an abusive step parent, or you know the the downsides of of these possibilities. You're you're kind of shortchanging your readers if you do not sort of treat them with with kind of frankness. Yeah, no, I love that you said honesty. I think that's that's really important and something that I think might be unexpected for an author to say this idea that you have to be you know truthful about this with kids because they're they're learning, they're questioning, they're curious. And that is something that as, as a teacher, I, I try my best to be honest with them as well and share that, you know, these are the stories, these are the perspectives. And even if something is fictional, like you've said, like the importance of researching. So researching that one in four people who summit Mount Everest don't make it, like that's important to, to have the kids understand throughout the story. So tying in something that's fictional and nonfiction and being able to explore that, which then, you know, gets me thinking about, the fort and the backstories and conflicts that these kids are grappling with, like the abusive stepfather. I'm, I'm, I don't want to give any spoilers, but I okay. just had a pivotal moment in the story where I'm just like, I'm ang I'm angry and I'm, I'm curious. And it's like, oh, honey, just, just tell somebody. But it's, it's really hard. Um, I think for us as adults to remind ourselves what it's like to be in a child's shoes and to have that power dynamic. Um, and to feel that I'm going to be in trouble if I tell, or I'm going to, I'm going to harm somebody else, like my mom, if I tell. And I find that these conflicts that, that you write are so real and raw that many young readers might be in these similar situations. So you're juggling these multiple characters and their background story. So we have, you know, the new kid, we have the kid with the abusive stepfather, we have Michael with, Mitchell with his OCD. How do you juggle these multiple characters and backgrounds and stories so that the readers feel connected? You have a lot of experience doing multiple perspectives and, and sometimes in stories, and I find that I'm trying to keep track of all the multiple perspectives, but I'm not feeling that in here. I feel like I'm getting, I'm understanding, I'm feeling enough depth and that every time I get to, I'm excited that I'm not like, okay, I'm done with Mitchell. Uh, now, now I'm going Ricky and I'm not um, upset. I'm excited to get to the next kid, but also like I'm keeping track of everybody. So how do you like think of, of the balance maybe, or how do you get readers to feel connected to the characters and conflicts, but also provide a bit of guidance to the reader who might be in a similar, facing a similar challenge um, as well? Well, the beauty of it, and this has nothing to do with me or my book, is that is the kids are kind of used to it now, right? Like they, a lot of books are told this way today. And I know when I first started doing uh, books from multiple perspectives, in, in, you know, back in the 90s, I, I would hear things like, well, you know, I was kind of got confused here and there. I wasn't exactly sure who was talking at, at, at any given moment. Um, and I think that as, you know, like anything, right, like kids, uh, you, you sort of wire yourself, you wire your brain to uh, to kind of keep track of who's who, who the narrator is when you read more books that are, are told that way. Um, I think for me, the, the other thing is voice, right? Like um, I try to really internalize what each character's voice is going to be so that you don't necessarily have to like flip back to the, you know, to the, the beginning of the chapter to figure out you're not going to become untethered from who's speaking because who's speaking is kind of obvious to you based on what they're saying and, and how they're saying it. Um, and I think that's something that I, I'm pretty, uh, you know, pretty diligent about when I'm, when I'm writing books from multiple perspectives. It's really cool. It's, it's definitely one where I'm not like, okay, who's talking right now? It's, it's very in the voice to keep track of them. All right. So I have heard, um, and you have shared many times your story of how you first became published, which is awesome back in middle school by accident. Um, it, it's, something that's I think really special and really unique and, and speaks to a lot of kids who, are, who think, oh my God, there's no way I could grow up and be an author. It just seems so incredibly far away. Once your first book was published, what made you want to continue to write? And since you've been a writer for so long, how do you keep the writing spark alive? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I, I sometimes wake up in the morning and ask myself that very question. <laughs> um, but I, I think for me, you know, uh, I mean, it was pretty fluky, right? With that, with that English project. Um, 
for the track and field coach and and you know but once once um that had been or not even was published but but I knew that it was going to be published it, it kind of you know I wrote the second book almost to prove it wasn't a fluke you know see if I could do it again and it became my hobby and the whole thing kind of went from you know project to hobby to summer job uh, and eventually when I graduated college, it was my real job. But I think there are just some people who love to tell stories, mm. right? And um, I, I don't know why that is, why, why it's sort of some of us have that bug and some of us do not. You know, um, I know that when I was three years old, you know, sitting around the Thanksgiving dinner table, when somebody told a really good joke and everybody laughed, like I admired that person, you, you know, that, that I was, I'm going to be that person one of these days, even when I didn't, even when I was too young to get the joke, right? <laughs> yeah, I, it's just, I, I could just tell that when you're the person who they talk and everybody else listens and kind of responds, like that was who, who I wanted, I, I wanted to be, you, you know? So, um, so obviously I've had my issues uh, throughout my career. Um, obviously, you, you know, when you publish a book and it's not successful, you're, you're discouraged and, and, you know, you have certain books that you think are going to be your big break and they just aren't. Um, but then those are balanced out by things that kind of come out of nowhere and, and find their audience and they've got that spark and boom, they, they just, they just work, you know, um, I, I have a book restart that I really thought was going to be, you know, I didn't think it was going to be like a, particularly successful book and it's you know you know it's really has has actually since been my my bestseller and and has just uh consistently found a home in in schools and in, in classrooms and it, it's just you know kind of magically connected with an audience and, and you never know so so I think it's just um it, it's just you, you kind of you kind of you know try to accentuate the positive right like sort of sort of zoom in on the things that are really working for you um kind of you know I mean, you can't keep yourself from getting discouraged when something doesn't work out and, and you just and you just keep at it and one of the things that i'm really kind of proud of is that you know um so if you look at my books you, you know when you think of when you think of somebody, let's say like a band or something like that, that's been around for 44 years, you generally the pattern is that all their famous stuff was like a long, long time ago, you know, and all the really good stuff. And now they're just, you know, they're on their 14th nostalgia tour, right? I remember when I was a freshman in college, we all went to see the Rolling Stones in 1981. And we even had a sense then that, that, that it was kind of like a nostalgia kind of tour and you know 41 years later they're they're still out there right um but for me one of the things i'm really proud of is if, if you look at my uh most successful books the ones that are really sort of connecting with an audience it's all like lately you, you know restart and you know the fort and operation do-over and ungifted and the unteachables like a lot of those a, a lot of my most successful things uh, come from the last, you know, the last certainly quarter of my writing career. That's awesome. You you're still you're still climbing that mountain. That's 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 impressive. It is. I, I, I still hope. I, I still honestly feel like my next book can be my next book. <laughs> Sorry, my best book can be my my next book. You know, I uh, I, I really believe that. That's amazing. That's a, that's a fantastic mindset to have. So with all of your experience writing books, I know that you write a lot, you write predominantly fiction books, but what aspects of yourself and your lived experiences have you included in your work? And how do you choose which real experiences, traits, people um, to add to your stories? You know, I, I'm, I guess I don't really think of it that way. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a plot guy. And, and so a lot of times, um, you know, I, I almost look at my my characters as as like you know the team of thieves in Ocean's Eleven, right? Like they're they are the team of of characters and personalities that you need to execute the plot, right? To to complete the the operation. Um, 
but uh, but certainly, you know, I've always been a suburban kid, you know, uh, I, you know, living sort of not in, but sort of outside a reasonably large city. So I think a lot of my books read like that. Um, you, you know, uh, some of my my experiences, um, you know, I don't want to like necessarily get people sort of reading through my books with a fine tooth comb, but I would say more of my characters are only children that then would would um, would normally happen in the world, <laughs> and um, and I'm an only child, you, you know. So so inevitably, uh, a, a certain amount of your own experience is going to sort of seep into. Uh, seep into those uh those sort of stories and and tropes and kind of uh themes that keep coming up again and again in your writing that's cool that's interesting i, I love how you say that your focus is on is on the plot because i definitely like when when i'm personally reading i guess I, I i zoom into the characters but i like to see this other perspective too so well, i have yeah, I think, you know th there are a lot of books where um and, and wonderful books where if you really describe what happens, not that much does, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, and the journey is kind of inside the main character's head or, or, or something like that. Uh, and again, like I said, some of my favorite books are, are like that, but that, that's kind of not me. You know, I, I like books where, um, you know, where a lot happens, especially also when I think of kid readers, particularly, mm -hmm. right? There's, um, there's sort of like, the best part perspective, right? Kid walks up to another kid's like, what book did you just finish? And, oh, what was the, what were the good parts? You know, what, what were the best parts? And I want, you know, it, it shouldn't be like, well, there was this moment where, you know, he or she reflected and you know, I want it to be like, they did this and then this happened and then this, happened. you know, that, that, that's kind of, that's kind of my thing. You know, uh, I, I always tell kids when I'm writing, you know, um, I find uh, middle school kids, particularly um, when they say, you know, oh, my problem is I keep writing and writing and writing and I don't know how to make it end. It usually means it never started, right? It, it's just uh, sort of, it's sort of a premise, not, not a story. So I'm really, really big on, you know, the most important thing is making the jump from premise you know basic idea to something that has a beginning and a middle and an end and so I always want to have the beginning at least some sense of the ending and two or three kind of major moments in between right um if, if I was a movie maker I'd say like set pieces you know like like those those big those big moments and um and I think that's uh well it's either it's either that's one of the reasons why I'm a plot guy, or maybe uh, I'm a plot guy because because I think in terms of those big moments. That's pretty cool. It's a really interesting way of looking at it. I'm glad you shared that. So I have to do ask, um, I'm going to ask the COVID question, but when I refer to COVID here, I don't just mean the physical pandemic. I mean, like everything that's happened in the past, like two and a half years. So these have been extraordinary years in every sense of the word. We've collectively and individually each experienced COVID and everything that comes with it. The next generator, generation, excuse me, the next generation of writers are living in a very different world than both you and I lived in. What advice do you have for today's young writers? How can they use their experiences the way you have to craft these stories? What, what's going to come out of this from, from this particular generation of, of young adults? Um, I mean, I, I, I kind of find, and this has nothing to do with COVID. This is, this is something that's been, been true for a long time before 2020 ever began, is that when I look at writers my age and older they all kind of they all kind of fell into it right you know uh i got this weird you know the track coach had to teach english in my school and you know john grisham was a working lawyer and you know lewis sacker got a law degree and and then his book got published and you know um and when i look at the the generation younger than me they all wanted to be writers from from the very beginning they were the kids who wrote for their 
you know, their middle school and high school literary magazines, and they and they took writing courses in college, and they and they and they sort of fashioned their their careers to to be writers. So so I am almost jealous of of the next generation of writers, just because it's something you can kind of choose to be, like young, you know, and, and it is. I mean. Anytime you're in like a freelance business, right, where, where you're where you're sort of, you know, you don't have a real, you don't have a what my dad would call a real job. Real job. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it's more nerve wracking. It's it's a little bit scarier, right? Um, you know, and it doesn't work out for everybody. Some of it's luck, right? Um, but uh, but I think that. I, I think that the next generation of writers are kind of in the bag, right? Because they've known for so long that what they really wanted to do was was tell stories. And they also, I think that the um, the toolkit is is so much kind of broader than it was in, in the old days, right? I mean, they've been blogging forever and posting fan fiction on, on Wattpad and, and you know, um, they've been thinking about, oh, should I write a graphic novel or should I do this as a, a screenplay? And, you know, um, now with respect to the pandemic and how we've all been sort of, you know, kind of, shut in by it and, and kind of uh, really atomized by it. Um, you know, I, I think we're, we've yet to see what that, um, what that result is, is going to be. You know, um, I um, am still kind of hoping that, that we're gonna get past it sort of fundamentally unchanged, um, but, but, but certainly something is gonna come from how virtual our lives have become you know how many people sort of go to school virtually and work virtually and you know to me um if you read a book like the four or any of my books right i mean so much of the i mean you know if i at the risk of sort of seeming like i'm pumping it up a little bit too much like so much of the magic comes when you're just writing uh writing about a, a you know character's dialogue and they're just sort of bantering back and forth and and i sometimes feel like like so much comes from those kind of throwaway conversations that's just so special in terms of uh teaching yourself as a writer who these characters are and i almost wonder if uh i, I hope that that uh, is is not something that gets lost as kids grow up spending more and more of their time not in physical contact with the people that they're interacting with, but but doing it virtually. Doing a stream, yeah. It's I'm very curious to see how that happens too. This past um, weekend, I was at an art exhibit and I saw the first piece of art where somebody was wearing a mask, and I it, it struck me, and I was like, this is the first time I've I've seen like somebody who is an artist, whether they are in literature or they paint or with that as their expression. And it really stuck with me. It was like, oh my gosh, like this is going to be something that carries on. And I really hope that we use, like we are doing now, like this is awesome to be able to, to communicate and talk to you, even though we're not physically in the same room. I hope we, we use the positives of that. But just as you said, the importance of dialogue and having those, those small moment conversations where the kids are not looking at a screen oh I hope that doesn't get lost I hope it doesn't hey Brian yeah, fingers crossed here too I know oh we just, <laughs> you came at just the the right time I've just finished um with some of the questions I had for for Gordon here Brian you're muted you're please. muted <laughs> well that doesn't happen too often people probably want to be <laughs> often I was wondering why, like I was, I was trying to interrupt and I was like, okay, they're not hearing me. So I have three <laughs> things, three things to say. One is this book or this book or any of the books by Gordon Corman, go out and buy them today. Wonderful. Two, I wanted to say that I wish Gordon was with us this week at the Young Adult Literacy Labs, not only because of his brilliant way of approaching plot, just to see him plot out his next story on the, the 
walls that we have. This building has walls where you can write on the walls. It's just, I've never seen anything like it. And the kids are plotting out their structure. It's really, really kind of amazing. And, and the third thing I was, when you were talking about the young, young hippie boy, um, and then going into the make mainstream and trying to like face, like, how do you go from a commune to the real world? And it reminded me of 1998 Best American Short Stories. A woman named Maxine Swan wrote a book called Flower Children. And I just think it's one of the most exquisite short stories ever, just about like these kids who were just raised totally free and in a hippie world. And then one day, one day they were like, oh, we have to go and conform to the way society wants us. And it's just such a, a delicate, beautiful story that makes you think like, yeah, what does happen to, when, to kids who are raised without boundaries? But anyway, beautiful interview, wonderful. I know Allison has a, a closing prompt before Tanya comes in, so. I do, I do. So here is a closing prompt that'll kind of hopefully tie back to what we were speaking about here. We started off with, where's your happy place? I wanna end with, who are your people? Sometimes we seek refuge from the world around us by going back to the people who make us feel the best. Who brings out the best in you? Great question. Lovely. Yeah, I love that one. And I think maybe that's, uh, you know, for what I write, even more, uh, e even more important, right, than, than, than your happy place, right? It, it's so much about uh, groups of, you know, well, I say groups of kids, but groups of people. It, it's the, the connections we form between us that, uh, that's everything. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I always get the last word. So I want to thank you for your thoughtful questions, Allison. I think we did learn a lot about Gordon's uh, um, history as a writer, but also his process. And I think um, it was really, I, like Brian, I'm really struck by the power of, of the opportunity for kids to hear somebody talk about um, a plot and, and um, and the driving power of a plot. And I love, I'm going to use a million times the difference between a premise and a story. <laughs> that was really a helpful idea. I think could really help kids a lot. Uh, Gordon, we are, I, I mean, as a person who grew up in love with Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing and The Great Brain, I am really happy to talk to an author who's uh, been steeped in children's literature for this probably the same amount of time that I have and who's written a hundred of beloved of the beloved books that we have available to young people. Thank you so much for your whole oeuvre and for bringing us the four and letting us celebrate it with you this summer. All right, thanks so much for having me. This was a ton of fun. Great. Um, I also wanna, it's always my job to thank our listeners too. We're so glad that you're here. These shows are for you. Don't miss another one. If you aren't already, please go to nwp.org and get signed up for our newsletter. So you never miss an episode of The Right Time or a lot of other great events for teachers hosted by The Writing Project. Um, if you wanna continue a conversation, about the relationship between plot and characters or how to support young writers in thinking those things through, please join us in the studio, uh, um, the Right Now Teacher Studio. You can find that at studio.nwp.org. And we would love to invite you into our community of teachers who write and practice writing and teaching together. Um, and you can always find um, episodes of The Right Time and other great interviews on uh, NWP Radio. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Allison and Gordon, one more time. And always, Brian, I miss you when we don't talk every other week. So great to see you um, in your hot Connecticut summer. And I look forward to getting to our regular routine um, in September. Thank you, everybody. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP.